How exactly does social media cause anxiety and addiction? Like, what are the specific mechanisms that drive that? The one I want to focus on specifically for this video is the threat comfort cycle. And the reason I want to focus on it is that this has helped me a lot when I think about what is a healthy way for me to engage with information I encounter on social media. Now, I think most of us are aware at this point that social media uses threat-inducing and outrage-inducing content to engage us. That, that's fairly well known. What I think people don't realize is that that's often paired with comfort. In fact, it's paired with comfort that specifically addresses the thing that is causing you the most anxiety. So you feel anxiety about that. When that anxiety bubbles up, where do you go to manage the anxiety? Will you go online to consume information that will help assuage the anxiety? And a lot of information online does help with that because, of course, the better we understand something, the more, uh, the more it feels in our control. So there is some actual comfort in social media. But at the same time we're getting more comfort, we're also getting these little seeds to feed that anxiety. So it leads to this feedback loop that is threat comfort induced. So where I'm going with this is first I would like to lay out a hypothetical example. Then I want to talk about how I came to realize this. And finally, I'll talk about the way I think about this in terms of how it should shape our engagement with online information. Now, in watching myself, I have noticed when I'm feeling the most anxious. A lot of times I attach that anxiousness to something that is related to stuff I've consumed online. But that's also the time when I feel most compelled to go online and consume content exactly around the thing I'm anxious about. I've just noticed that in myself. And so thinking about things in this way has helped me to figure out uh, how to interact online. Okay, so first my hypothetical example, and I intentionally use examples that don't really exist so that I don't get people's hackles up. I don't want to evoke emotions that are sort of attached to some sort of social media vortex argument anywhere else. So here's the example. Let's say you're a parent and your kid gets rejected from a fancy pants summer camp. You may go online and look up alternatives to fancy pants summer camp. Like that might just be something you would naturally Google, you would naturally be thinking about, okay, my kid didn't get in, where else could they go? Well, if the algorithm knew that you had Googled that or looked that up on some platform like YouTube, it might sort of associate people who have looked that up with people who respond reactively to articles with titles like this. Kid rejected from summer camp based on medical diagnosis. And if you were to click into that kind of article, what you might find is sort of outrage inducing uh, content that sort of says, this kid was rejected from a summer camp based on their asthma. And with most of this stuff, it's not necessarily 100% false, it's just misportrayed. For example, you might have a situation where the kid was not allowed to participate in some sort of activity that was a heavy running based activity if that kid had exercise induced asthma. And then maybe the parent was like, well, if my kid can't participate in that thing that happens every Saturday, I'm going to pull my kid out of the program. I could see that happening and that being framed as kid is rejected from summer camp based on a medical diagnosis. Now, of course, that's going to raise worries in the parent's mind. And you could imagine some sort of scientists being interviewed or economists being interviewed where the economist says, yes, camps need to protect themselves from liability. They don't want get to get sued. So they're rejecting kids who are likely to sue them. You could see this, this sort of escalation and stoking of fears in that one article. Well, if the algorithm saw that you clicked on that instinctively, that you spent time on the article, perhaps that you went back to it, it might put you in a bucket of parents who are worried about this issue, not that the algorithms actually know what it's really about, 
but the algorithms know what it's about in the sense that they know if you responded well to that, you might respond well to this entire other body of content that is a time trap. And of course, time traps are just stuff that will keep you online if it's fed to you at a certain pace. They will make you go back to the platform more and more often. And what kind of content would this be? This might be content that says similar things, like kid is rejected from college based on medical diagnosis. And maybe that is, in this case, it's a mental health diagnosis. And maybe it's legitimate because, of course, if you look at all the things that lawyers are litigating in courts, you can probably come up with some of these that are legitimately someone being discriminated against for a medical diagnosis. So you feed these parents that kind of content. And when you get a group of people who starts to get anxious and really heavily invested in a topic like this, the topic, the content on that topic can expand exponentially because not only do you get the cases where there's litigation in court or where this one thing happened, you also get people analyzing those cases and giving their opinion about those cases and just talking about those cases more generally. And you can sort of drum up drama in this way. And social media has a set of tools for doing this. I think one of the biggest is prevalence bias. So if you ask the question, how often does a kid get rejected from summer camp, from, from like a, a prestigious summer camp based on a medical diagnosis, that probably does happen every year. And similar cases, rejection from jobs and colleges probably also happen. But if there are like five cases in that category per year, Social media can enhance people's perception of the probability of that by showing that content over and over, where the lizard parts of our brains is going to interpret frequency with which you see something as frequency with which this happens to people like your child. And it's not just the frequency or prevalence that has the bias. I think there's also bias in terms of, is this a rising phenomenon? Like, was it not very common a couple of years ago and all of a sudden cases like this and more discrimination is happening over and over? Well, if you can convince the brain, the unconscious part of the brain, that this is a growing trend, that's going to pull people in as well. And social media, of course, has ways of making it seem like the phenomenon is growing, which might involve the frequency at which you feed people this kind of information, where they may not necessarily go back and see, oh wait, this case was from 2014. They just see the increasing frequency of articles like this in their feed and headlines like this. So if the parent is starting to get anxious about this, about the possibility that their child is going to face a lifetime of discrimination based on their asthma, the parent may go online and Google, how can I make sure my kid is not discriminated against when they get into college? Now that that Googling seems very empowering, right? You're looking for information that will that will allow you to stand up to all of these fearful forces and do what's within your uh, ability to control to make sure that bad outcome for, from your child doesn't happen. It seems empowering and it actually is empowering. However, I think what people don't realize is that that, that seeking of the empowerment and that, that seeking of information that'll put our fears to rest, both of those are in the category of comfort that we seek online. And most of that comfort is going to be good comfort that, that gives us what we want from it, that assuages our fears. At the same time, it's also planting seeds to make this anxiety over this issue bigger. For example, that parent might read advice articles on uh, what kind of lawyers do you get in your, in your corner if your kid is about to apply for college? To whom should you hide your medical records from because they might use that information in a discriminatory way? These are sort of precautionary 
articles or videos or whatever that might help you and give you comfort that this issue is one that you can overcome as an empowered individual. However, almost all of these articles are probably going to be riddled with stories of incidences where this happened. And those little stories, um, those sort of continue to increase your perception of the prevalence of this issue which is going to heighten the sense of threat and anxiety you feel offline about this issue, which will drive you back online looking for solutions. This is a feedback loop. It's a feedback loop that can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now we might place that feedback loop in the context of the entire social environment. So social media might try out a bunch of different topics like this to see what different people react to. And if it tries 50 topics like this, where it tries to cluster content that will get people more and more engaged, it's essentially going to feel out what are the things that really get under people's skin? What are the things that, that will uh, lead to this sort of firestorm of engagement around this particular anxiety-inducing issue? And once it's found one of those that sort of takes off like wildfire, social media has ways of generating more content by getting people to comment on it, bringing in experts on um, influencers' websites, all of that kind of stuff. It can, it can blow up the issue that people are found to be responding well to. So, so that is one mechanism that I think social media uses to addict and to cause anxiety among the population. Now, how did I come across this idea? Um, and I don't even remember who it was who said this, but one thing that I like to talk to people about in my life is why, why I mean, why are people so polarized, basically? Why do people sort of follow the party line and sort of think all in the same way as other people like themselves? Why don't they interact well across difference? And someone mentioned in an offhand way well, the news companies are just meant to create comfort for their audiences. And my first reaction to that was, wait a second, I've been saying all along that they're trying to create threat, not comfort. So initially I was like, no way. But once I thought about it a little bit more, I realized, wait a second, that's like the golden pair, the threat comfort cycle, where the, the threat makes it seem urgent that you engage, the comfort uh, makes it seem like when you're not on platform, like you need to go back to, uh, to quell your fears. That pair of things is absolutely the golden ticket for these social media algorithms. In which case, understanding this has actually helped me to be more self-aware about my own social media use. So there's basically three things that I think this way of thinking about social media should inspire us to do as we engage online. And the first one is to be aware of our mood. Because for certain, when we're feeling more anxiety, a lot of times that's going to drive us online. And of course, when we're feeling anxiety, we're not in a good critical thinking mode. As a matter of fact, if we're encountering a lot of information, including misinformation and highly emotionally charged information, you want a clear cognitive state to parse through that. And when you're feeling high levels of anxiety, that's the opposite of a clear cognitive state. So I've certainly tried to notice when I'm feeling anxious and those days I just say, you know what? This is not a day to be on social media. I can be on social media on days when, when I'm feeling stronger, when I'm feeling my critical thinking brain is turned on. The second thing that this has helped me to do is to just be more aware of the things that I think cause me anxiety. And I think we need to acknowledge that we don't always have accurate attachments between our feelings and the things that cause them. Because when we think about anxiety, there's a lot of things that might cause anxiety, you know, a deadline coming up at work, an interpersonal conflict from a week ago, things we're reading about at various places on social media. We may not be able to figure out where that anxiety is coming from, but our brains like it best when we attach that anxiety to some cause. 
us because that makes us feel more in control. Then we can actually go after the cause to try to reduce our anxiety. And I think it's this sort of uh, locus of control, locus of false control, where we're looking for how do we assuage the anxiety? Oh, I go online to learn more about the thing that's making me anxious. It's that cognitive habit that is driving some of this addiction. So because of that, keeping tabs on what are the five things that make me most anxious according to my brain or that I'm most worried about. And I think especially who are the people that I'm most worried about? What are those people like? Are those people in my life? Do I need to treat them with more respect or less fear and anxiety when I encounter those people. I think just being aware of who are the threats, the threats according to you, I think is a good cognitive habit given the way social media is likely to stoke our anxieties as I've described. And then the third thing I think is just a wise way of approaching social media is to spend more time on long form types of social media where the conversation can take many different turns, where you can explore things more deeply, because this, these forces that I'm describing here, they work well from an evolutionary standpoint if they can tr test out a lot of different headlines, a lot of different titles of content that you could click on. That's how they sort of learn how to stoke, how to push our buttons, how to stoke our fear. And so I'm at least very aware, when am I on social media types that have a lot of quick bursts of content versus long forms of content? And I think reading books is actually a really good way to counteract the social media world because they're just longer. Someone has to have thought a lot about something to put together a book. And of course, a lot of books were written in other times when the information war that we're in right now was not a thing. And so that can be very, very grounding to read books instead of consume in the moment content. So what are your tips for avoiding the threat comfort cycle on social media? What do you do to try to stay sane and to try to consume information in a way that doesn't distort reality too much? Put your answer below because I'm very curious to hear like what people are thinking about on this sort of topic.